Good morning and welcome to the worship of the true and living God on this, the first day of the week, on the day of our Lord's uh, resurrection and triumph over uh, the grave. A uh, few announcements uh, this week. Uh, the Youth Sunday School will uh, resume or, or, or start again next week. Um, uh, the Wilsons welcomed a new baby, which is the reason for uh, the delay. So the Youth Sunday School will meet upstairs in the... Uh, the second floor of this building. Also, we're in uh, need of additional volunteers to help especially care for uh, younger members of the congregation, workers in the nursery on Sundays, as well as teachers on uh, Wednesday night for the young children. So if you're interested, you can uh, talk to me or one of the other elders. Also, the, uh, uh, the small parlor, the room uh, just out there across from the bathroom uh, during the worship service is a uh, room for uh, mothers of young children. It's the Audio from the worship service is uh, broadcast in there, so if uh, you mothers need that, uh, that's available uh, for you. I think that's all of the announcements that I'm going uh, to highlight. You can uh, read the rest uh, for yourself. Let's stand as we are called into worship with Psalm 96. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord. Bless His name. Tell of His salvation from day to day. Declare His glory among the nations, His marvelous works among all the peoples. For great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods. For the gods of the peoples are worthless idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Amen. Let's take up our Trinity hymnal, turning to number 12, singing together from Psalm 135. Trinity hymnal number 12.
Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, we praise you that you have dwelt with your people, that you have made Zion your dwelling place, and that you sent forth your beloved Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, that he should die and prepare a place for us, that we may be with him where he is. We praise you, O Lord Jesus Christ, and our Heavenly Father, that you have sent your Spirit, the Spirit of holiness to apply the redemption of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so, O oh, great triune God, hear our prayers, hear our praises, inhabit those praises of your people. For we ask in Jesus' name, amen. Christian, what do you believe? I believe in God the Father. Please be seated. We are called and comforted even in our uh, confession of sin uh, this morning. As David tells us, calling out to God, he says, Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, O God of my salvation. And my tongue will sing aloud your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips and I will declare your praise. And so as we come to confess our sins, we are reminded that we do so with a God who cleanses our blood guiltiness. Let's pray together. Most loving and merciful.
Amen. Brethren, lift your heads as we hear these words which assure us of God's pardon. For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Amen. Let's stand and sing to God's praise from Psalm 27 in our order of worship. Amen. Please be seated. We read in Psalm 36, Your steadfast love, O Lord, extends to the heavens, your faithfulness to the clouds. Your righteousness is like the mountains of God. Your judgments are like the great deep. Man and beast, you save, O Lord. How precious is your steadfast love. The children of mankind take refuge in the shadow of your wings. They feast on the abundance of your house. You give them drink from the river of your delights. But with you is the fountain of life. And in your light do we see light. So the deacons have come down to wait upon us. The scripture reminds us, tells us, and we confess that we believe that God is the source of all that we have. We have all eaten and benefited from his abundance. And so now we return back to him a worthy portion of what he's first given to us. Let's look to God in prayer. Our Lord, our God in heaven, 
Your steadfast love is precious. You have made known your light. You are our light and our salvation. You guard our lives. We fear you, and so we have nothing left to fear. You are the God of our salvation. Even if all others should forsake us, you have taken us in, granting us life and righteousness, mercy and grace, that we may dwell in your house all our days from this time forth and forevermore. Indeed, our God, you are marvelous, excellent, glorious in your faithfulness. You are the strength of your people, for all life comes from you. Your voice thundered forth and was created, for all life comes from you. Your voice is full of majesty and power. It's from the voice of Christ, the word of Christ, that we have new spiritual life. And so we praise you, our God and King, with thankfulness that you have adopted us so that we may call you Father and know that you are willing and able to help us. This morning we intercede on behalf of your saints in Cuba. We ask that you would strengthen them in spirit and truth, enabling them to persevere in your grace as they testify to your salvation and worship you this day. Would you break the back of the wicked government on that island, which harasses your people and oppresses all the people on that land? Would you raise up righteous and just rulers for Cuba? We likewise pray for the nation of Indonesia, filled with Mohammedans and other pagans who do not know your gospel. Would you make the name of Christ to be famous in that nation? Would you bless the efforts of Scott and Jenny Phillips as they bring the word of truth to the, to the Tao tribe? that many will come to the light and life of Christ. In our own presbytery, we ask your blessing upon the saints who have gathered to worship you at Grace Community Church in Trenton. Would you bless their worship? Would you renew the efforts of their pastor, Hutch Garmony, as he returns from sabbatical? We do thank you for the rest and refreshment he enjoyed. Would you grant him fruitful ministry now that he's back in the pulpit and among the saints there? Would you give wisdom to the session and to the diaconate as they look to build uh, a meeting house? Would you grant them wisdom? Would you provide for them? Would you enable that congregation to worship in spirit and truth, that the elders would set before them the whole counsel of God so that the people there may by your spirit worship you as you command in your word? Within our own congregation, we pray especially for Elaine Pierce. Would you Preserve and bless her. Would you grow her in spiritual maturity? Strengthen her that she may rest in the Lord Jesus Christ more richly and deeply. Would you make the treatment for her infirmities effective? Would you grant her patience in her ailments? Above all, let her trust in the Lord Jesus Christ in every season and through these many afflictions. Others who are sick and afflicted, we bring before you those recovering from surgery, that all these might hope in you, that they would be encouraged by your care for them. Jack and Cecilia Sargent, Fred and Donna Pierce, thank you that they are back worshiping with you. Would you continue to increase Fred's strength? Margaret Davis, Margaret Wilson, John and Joyce Watson, Sandra Taylor, Donna Johnson, Nancy Maney, and others who are afflicted and enduring recoveries that are not as speedily as they had hoped. Even as we pray for healing, we rejoice in thanksgiving for the birth of Elida Sue Wilson this past week. Would you restore Rachel to full health? Thank you for sustaining her during the delivery. Would you grant that Elida would know your covenant? Would you bless Joe and Rachel as they set before her the truths of Christ? enabling Joe and Rachel to model godliness before her and to adjust well to being parents in this way. Father, would you grant us, grant us godly fear that you would free us from all, all anxiety and fear, even as we ask you to show mercy upon this land. Would you free us from uh, the rulers that we deserve, but instead uh, give us rulers who love your truth, 
who will promote righteousness and good behavior? Would you bring an end to tyranny in the land that your truth may be proclaimed freely? We lift up before you those among us who have gone on military deployments, Ben Rowan. Would you strengthen him as he studies in Rhode Island? Would you give him peace as he's far from home? Would you preserve his mind? Would you grant him wisdom as he is surrounded by a new people, many of whom no doubt have embraced new ideas? Would you keep him steadfast in your word? We pray for Luke Wilson, asking that you would protect him on deployment overseas and that his heart would be drawn to the Lord Jesus Christ. That he would walk in uh, your light, that you would provide uh, companionship to encourage him in the Lord Jesus Christ. Hear us now, do all things according to your will, and hear our prayers as we pray, using that former prayer that Jesus gave, saying, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Let's stand and take out our order of worship. Turning to page 4, we'll sing together Psalm 44. Amen. Please be seated. If you have your copy of the scripture, would you take it out and turn with me to the gospel according to John? John's gospel, chapter 7. No, chapter 8. Sorry. John's gospel, chapter 8. Looking this morning at uh, verse 12. I had intended to preach verses 12 uh, to 20. Um, I even had an alliterated five point outline, all starting with the letter L. Uh, but uh, then I, I thought we would want to be done before 1.30. So, John chapter 8, verse 12. The feast is concluded. Uh, the Savior continues, though, in the temple and its precincts, even after many of the crowds have gone home. Jesus yet continues to teach. 
He applies the symbolism of the liturgy uh, to himself. The actions of the feast, the symbolism of the feast are still fresh in people's minds. And so uh, he shows how those truths have been foreshadowed and rehearsed. Those truths foreshadowed and rehearsed in the feast find their fulfillment in him. Now, if you have your copy of the Scripture open, and I hope you do, you'll see the first 11 verses of chapter 8 are uh, in brackets in the English Standard Version and many other versions as well. Uh, the oldest and best manuscripts do not include the first part of John 8, or they include only a part of it. Uh, even though some of the early manuscripts that do include it make a notation indicating the uncertainty uh, as to whether this was part of John's Gospel originally. Calvin, in his commentary on John, says this, It is plain enough that this passage was unknown anciently. I didn't know you could adverb the word ancient, but Calvin does it. Anciently to the Greek churches, and some conjecture that it has been brought in from other, some other place. Likely, this, uh, those first 11 verses were taken by another source and added by a scribe. There's nothing in them that contradict the Scripture, but uh, doesn't seem to match John's writing. The context also seems to depart uh, from you know, what is going on at the end of chapter 7 and then what picks up in verse 12 of chapter 8. Uh, so it seems out of place contextually. So in this uh, chapter 8, the geography has not changed much, uh, but the subjects of uh, what John tells us have changed. Jesus continues to teach, but it's no longer the crowd who are his primary interlocutors. His new adversaries is, is the Pharisees, the Jewish authorities. He's confronted by adversaries now, rather than the people generally. And so we'll look at verse 12 uh, this week. Verses 12 to 20 form uh, a small section in which the enemies of the Lord Jesus Christ attack his witness. And then in verses 21 to 24, there's a warning from the Lord Jesus Christ against dying in sin. And then in verses 25 to 30 of this chapter, uh, Jesus describes his relationship with the Father, the relationship of the Father and Son. And then in verses 31 to 47, Jesus denounces his opponents as slaves to sin. And then he concludes this chapter speaking of the glory the Father gives to the Son. And so we'll be looking at just verse 12 in this chapter, but that's what's ahead of us in weeks to come. Before we read God's word, let's pray, asking for his help and blessing. Almighty God, we thank you for your word. We thank you that it is true. We thank you that your uh, spirit speaks to us in the scripture. And we ask, our Father, that you would give us eyes to see and ears to hear. That we might behold the wonders out of your law, that we might delight in it, that we might love it. That it would be more precious to us than silver. That it would be sweeter to us than honey, even from the honeycomb. that it would be our portion, day and night. Forgive us of our sins. Forgive us of our neglect of your word. And speak to us yet again, O Holy Spirit, for we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Romans chapter 8, verse 12. Again, Jesus spoke to them, saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, that will have the light of life. Amen. Thus far in God's holy, inspired, and inerrant word. Jesus reveals more of his identity, and along with revealing more of himself, he gives a great promise to the people who follow him. And so let's look in the first place uh, at the liturgy of the feast. The Feast of Tabernacles, the Feast of Booths, as it's alternatively called, was the Jewish Thanksgiving feast in which the people camped in tents, in booths. Uh, the feast had taken on something of a dual purpose. It was originally when Israel remembered their forefathers' time in the wilderness and how God manifested His presence with His people and provided for His people in the wilderness. And we gave them bread and water. But it had taken on a, 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 secondary, a secondary significance in that the people 
remembered and gave thanks for God's continued provision in the late harvest. And so this feast was the highlight of the year. And we looked a couple or three weeks ago at the liturgy surrounding uh, the water offerings, how the feast pointed forward to what Jesus would give to his people, that Jesus is the one who provided Israel water from the rock. That they drank from him in the wilderness, that he is the rock that followed Israel in the wilderness. And so he announces that he gives to the spiritually thirsty drink, that they may be satisfied forevermore. And remember, in the feast, the, the priest of Israel would make an elaborate offering of water to God. The, the Savior, at that point, stood and offered to quench the thirst of any who come to him. And the festival also had an elaborate lamp lighting uh, liturgy. There'd be four massive lamps, four large candelabra in the court of the temple, which would be ceremonially lit. The men of Israel each night would dance holding burning torches, which sounds like a fire hazard. And you can just picture the, the Levites, the, the deacons standing there just thinking this is going to burn the whole thing down. Uh, but the, the, the men of Israel would gather in, our deacons are sweating now, uh, this is the thought. Um, but the, the, the men of Israel holding uh, torches would be, would be dancing in, in, in the temple courts. Uh, singing, the, the, the Levites who weren't worried about the, the fire hazard were playing music. The people cut loose in, in celebration. And the light of the temple would cast a glow over the whole city of Jerusalem. It was a glorious, a joyful celebration, remembering all God had done. But now we pick up in John eight twelve. The lights have gone out. The feast is over. And so Jesus stands and proclaims, I am the light of the world. And that's the background of what Jesus says. He offers himself as the fulfillment of the symbolism of that liturgy, the lighting of the feast. Just as he offered to quench the thirst So now he offers to be and offers light that comes in the darkness following the feast. He declares for anyone with eyes to see and ears to hear that he fulfills all the hopes, all the spiritual truths, all the promises that are contained in the feast and its liturgy. Everything the Old Testament ritual anticipated finds its fulfillment and its meaning in himself. Just as the water looked back to the provision of water in the wilderness, so too the lights, the, the lamps, the dancing looked back to the pillar of cloud and fire which guided and guarded Israel in the wilderness. So now Jesus reveals He is the one who drew near to Israel in the fire and kept His people all those years in their journey from Egypt to the promised land. Now don't miss though that this is the third instance in as many chapters in which Jesus draws from the wilderness imagery, the wilderness provisions to explain himself, his identity, and his mission. Right, he's the, the bread of life. He offers himself as spiritual drink, and now he is the light of the world. There's dignity, there's gravity, there's weight in that little sentence, isn't there? He's clearly resuming the discourse he had begun, begun earlier in the feast. This is his, of course, his second I am statement, right? The first was I am the bread of life. He speaks in the, the style of deity as he had previously. It's emphatic. I, I am the bread of life. Now, G, John has already told us that Jesus is the light of men, right? John 1, 4. Now Jesus indicates the final age has dawned. This is what Isaiah had hoped for. Isaiah 60, verses 19 and 20. The sun shall be no more your light by day, nor for brightness shall the moon give you light, but the Lord will be your everlasting light, and your God will be your glory. Your sun shall go down no more, nor your moon withdraw itself. 
For the Lord will be your everlasting light, and your days of mourning shall be ended. And the apostle later would foresee the culmination of all that Jesus promises. Once you turn there to Revelation, the Revelation to John uh, 21. Revelation 21. What Jesus promises here, what he offers here, finds its fulfillment in Revelation 21, verse 23. Speaking of the new Jerusalem, the heavenly city. And the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light. And its lamp is the Lamb. By its light the nations walk, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it, and its gates will never be shut by day. And there will be no night there. Many religions, no less Judaism in this feast, feature light. Search for light. Hope for light. Enlightenment. And Jesus testifies here that He is the true light. He's the only light. He testifies He is the one from whom all lights draw. He is the light of the world. Light is unmistakable, isn't it? That's the thing about light. It's, it's hard to hide light. Light casts no shadow. Light testifies to itself. I remember watching an old movie. I think Cary Grant was in it. Um, it was black and white. It was set during World War II. Uh, I don't remember the plot. It was uh, set in an English village. Uh, there was a there was an air defense warden. He was he was coming around. He was knocking on doors, and he rebuked Cary Grant because there was I don't remember who Cary Grant was playing. That's the actor's name. You understand? And he re he rebuked Cary Grant because some of the uh, the the air raid uh, lines were were letting out just a little bit a crack of light from his window. And the air raid warden went to say, you know, even from 10,000 feet, a cigarette butt can, can shine out like a beacon, given, given, uh, given there's no other light. I don't know whether that was true, um, but the point still stands that uh, light is unmistakable. Light can't be hidden. Light cannot but bear witness to itself. Everything we know is known relative to light. And so what is Jesus saying? But that He is the only one who can enable us to know anything. Only in Him can anything be known. I am the light of the world, He says. And so we should see by way of application that Jesus comes to remedy our natural condition. All men are born blind by nature. Here, the Savior offers freedom from darkness to enable us to dwell in His light. Pay close attention then to what the Savior says about Himself. He is the light of the world. Bishop Ryle laments that the majority of men neither see the value of their own souls, nor the nature of God, nor the reality of the world to come. He notes that despite the discoveries of art and science, darkness covers the earth. Jesus is the only remedy to that darkness. And we see that all the more clearly today that all sorts of people and philosophies and things claim to be light, claim to offer explanation and satisfaction and warmth and belonging and protection and wisdom. But the Lord Jesus Christ is the only light. He came to save sinners. He came to die as our substitute. And now He has risen to defeat death and reigns at God's right hand, head over all things to the church. But I wonder if you see the value of your own soul. You know that Christ and Christ alone can rescue, that only Christ can give you Light, that only Christ can give you freedom from the condemnation of sin. Well, are you diligently pursuing Christ? Are you diligently pursuing Christ? Or do you lightly consider your soul and pursue 
Christ only half-heartedly, only when convenient, only when it requires little effort, only when your parents or your friends or your family pursue you. Are you pursuing Christ? See, the, the glory of the Savior's mercy. He is the light of the world, and yet He offers, he offers Himself as a friend for sinners. He offers Himself to sinners, to people who walked in great darkness. He comes to them. He comes as the light to shine upon those trapped in the darkness of sin and death. Of course, no one will come to Christ until they see that the world is darkness, until they recognize they are blind, dead in trespasses and sins and outside of Christ. And so here is Christ proclaiming, I am the light of the world. He freely offers life and welcome to all who will come to him, but you must come to him. You must leave off following the world and come to Christ. The Apostle Paul reflects on this reality in Colossians 1.12. We give thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of His beloved Son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Have you come to Christ? You see, uh, the Savior offers Himself as the light of the world. But to whom does He give this promise? Look at the recipients of the promise with me. He says, I am the light of the world. He promises a blessing. But to whom does He give this promise? He gives this promise to those who follow Him. Further linking Himself with that pillar of fire which guided Israel in the wilderness. Follow here is in the present tense, indicating a wholehearted discipleship. Following him, not casually, but with devotion. Israel followed the pillar of fire in the wilderness, and they were protected and provided for by him. Likewise, his disciples follow wherever the Lamb goes, since they have been redeemed from mankind for God. So the promise is for those who follow Him. Following Christ is essential for life, isn't it? The Savior does not offer light to all men equally and without distinction. He offers His light to those who follow Him. Others continue in darkness. Why does He use this verb, follow? Well, it's another word, another way for him to explain believing. It's another way he explains what it is to believe on Christ. Right? Earlier he said, whoever believes in me, and he said, whoever comes to me, now he says, whoever follows me. All of which are describing the, the same thing. Not merely mental assent or agreement, but more than that, believing, coming, following. Not just mental assent, not just agreement, not just acknowledgement that those certain things are true about Christ. Right? You can believe certain things are true without it having an impact on you. Right? I can believe that obesity has severe negative health outcomes, and yet on Friday night I can drive and pick up a couple of dozen donuts from Krispy Kreme because there was a sale. Right? You can assent to a truth. You can acknowledge its truthfulness. You can apply it less than seriously, or not at all. And so Jesus is, is using a number of verbs to describe what it is to have saving faith. Believe on Him, come to Him, follow Him. Receive and rest on Him alone as Savior. Each of these describes a facet, and an aspect of what saving faith is as the Lord Jesus Christ in this gospel unfolds for us what it is to believe on Christ. To subject every matter of truth and doctrine and desire and practice to Him as King. Let me ask you, do you follow Christ? The focus of this chapter will soon 
turn to whether Jesus has the authority to make such a claim. We'll consider the objection of the Pharisees to Jesus here. Do you follow Christ? Do you believe He has the right to make this claim? Do you follow Christ seriously, sincerely, sacrificially? What does your life say about your devotion to following Christ? Now, in a moment, I'm going to ask you a series of questions. And I don't want you to approach these questions as a, as a checklist of, of things to do, as much as diagnostic questions. Now, if you, if you, you know, you know, well, let's see, I've got to go see my, I've got my annual physical, my annual checkup tomorrow, so tonight I'm going to go to the gym. And then you go tomorrow and your, 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 your GP asks you, well, well, do you exercise? Yes, yes, I exercise. Well, great, how, how often? Well, once a year. The day before I come to see you. You, you can approach spiritual things like that too, can't you? Well, see, this is what I have to do, so I'm going I'm to do those things to check them off. I don't want you to approach these questions like that. I want you to think of them as diagnostics of your spiritual health, what you're currently doing and how you're currently living, what it indicates about your spiritual health, whether you're following Jesus and how closely you're following Jesus. And so let me ask you, do you worship Christ at home and with your family? If you're, if you're a head of household, a parent, a grandparent, are you leading your family in worship, re reading the Bible with your children, praying with them and praying for them, setting an example of godliness to them, talking about godly things with them, helping them to discern the difference between truth and error? Are you speaking of Christ with your family? Speaking about Christ with your family is a, a critical sign of spiritual life. Not simply that you think of Him at set times, but that He is in your thoughts throughout the week. That you've been cultivating godly affections in yourself, and then the overflow of that is the cultivation of godly affections in your family. Moses, in his final sermon, Deuteronomy 6, 4-7, to he, he said this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. All these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. And then he says, You shall teach them diligently to your children by taking them to Sunday school. No, that's not what he says, is it? You shall teach them diligently to your children. You shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise. You know, they didn't have Sunday school in the days of the Old Covenant Church or most of the time of the New Covenant Church. How did children learn the things of God? Their parents just talked with them about them. When you sit down and when you rise, when you walk by the way and when you sit in your house, that's how Moses articulated that the Old Covenant church should be teaching their children the things of God. Do you worship Christ in your home with your family? Another question. Do you worship Christ privately when no one is watching throughout the week? It's easy to appear spiritual when people are watching. But have you made God's truth, God's word, your meditation day and night? Not just on the Lord's Day morning and evening. Why is it some people, their thoughts are full of Christ? A friend of mine uh, was telling me about, the, uh, about his divorce proceedings. And he had called a witness, a neighbor lady, to, uh, as the judge was talking about, or I guess deciding on custody and the, uh, the neighbor lady, I asked, well, how did, you know, Mrs. So-and-so, how did, how did her testimony go? And he said, oh, Ryan, it was, it was beautiful. When, when she was speaking, you, you could never really tell whether she was, when she was quoting Scripture and when, when she was just speaking for herself, that she just wove Scripture in and out of her testimony. Wasn't it John Owen who said of 
of John Bunyan. If you, if you pricked him, he no, it was Chuck Spurgeon, wasn't it? If you pricked him, he bled Bible. He bled Bibline. Why is it that some people, as they're speaking, the word of Christ just rolls off their tongue? So you're never sure, is it, is it just their words, or, or are these the words of Scripture? Why is it? Because they love the law of God. Psalm 119, 97. Oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. You worship Christ with your family. Do you worship Christ privately? Do you worship Christ publicly? And do you make ready for being at worship a priority? Are you faithful in the Lord's house, Lord's Day morning and Lord's Day evening? Or do, you, do you make preparations to be gathered with the Lord's people, praying that the Lord would meet you as the day draws near? Are you on time? I'm concerned about what punctuality says about us. The deacons have, have told me that there are a large number of people congregating in the fellowship hall during the start of worship. I don't know what to make of that. But I am concerned about what it says about the spiritual health of the congregation when so many come late to worship. The call to worship is not just something that I read to get our minds oriented to spiritual things, something nice and spiritual and sentimental. You understand the call to worship is God's summoning of His people to worship Him. That this is not just a, a TED talk that we wander into in between coffee breaks. Are you on time to worship? Are you awake, alert, and ready to praise God and to hear from God, to bless God in worship so that we can come together as a congregation ready to worship our Savior and King? Worship is not just another lecture into which we coast like one of those required classes at college. It's something that requires our preparation and thought. The apostle in 1 Corinthians 14, as he summarizes his instructions to the church at Corinth, you know how he sums up everything he says about worship? He sums it up this way, 1 Corinthians 14, 40. But all things should be done decently and in order. Why? Well, therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, and let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. Do you worship Christ in your home with your family? Do you worship Christ privately? Do you worship Christ publicly? Fourth, is the service of Christ and His people something you desire and something that gives you joy? Are you seeking ways to serve others, ways to bless others in the household of faith, to serve Christ and His people? The glory of Christ, the, the peace and joy of His people, are, are, are those concerns of yours? For what you do, for how you spend your time and your money, what you do with your home and your hospitality, to bless Christ and His people. Galatians 6.10 so then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, and especially to those who are of the household of faith. Fifth, growing in obedience. Are you, are you growing in obedience? You worship Christ with your family. You worship Christ with yourself, by yourself, privately. You worship Christ publicly. Do you desire to be a blessing to serve Christ and His people. Fifth, are you growing in obedience? Is obedience something in which you are growing as your desires are brought more and more into conformity to Him who is the head? Christ saved you for holiness. Right? But He came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance, and He has given His Holy Spirit to lead you into all truth. And so... Let me ask you, are you seeing day by day, maybe not day by day, but month by month, year by year, are you seeing progress, growth, and holiness? Ephesians 4, 15 and 16. 
Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Five, five questions. Diagnostic questions. I'm not so much interested in mere behavior modification, although behavior modification is better than nothing because the means of grace are powerful. But my concern here is primarily to diagnose, help you diagnose where you are spiritually. Maybe some of these things are, are matters that you've never considered. Uh, from time to time, I'll be confronted with the, the Scriptures teaching myself on things uh, that I thought were fine, and then realizing I need to repent of those things. So if you've never considered these things, or, or you've realized you're not following the Lord Jesus Christ very well, well, then turn in repentance. You can seek Him and seek His mercy that He promises to all who ask Him. Find grace to help in time of need. Find spiritual strength to grow in your following of Him that you may progress in holiness. But don't see this merely as a, as a list of things to do. If I do these things, then I am in Christ. So see these as indications of your spiritual life of how you're following Christ as a, as a spiritual checkup. These are diagnostic questions that just reveal where you are, revealing where your weaknesses are, revealing where your need of grace is, revealing what your desires are and how your desires and priorities may need to be reoriented in the light of Christ as you repent and you turn to Him and you experience the riches of His grace afresh. So those are the diagnostic questions. Here's the list of things to do. Turn, repent, seek grace, and then grow in affection for Him. See your desires change as you behold the loveliness of Christ. Recognize your own emptiness, your own wretchedness, your own powerlessness, and plead with Him to forgive you, to give you life, to show you His loveliness, beauty, and goodness. Take your sinful desires to Him. Take your sins to Him. And find mercy. He is the light of the world. And He invites you to take your shame to Him. The shame that you conceal from everyone. Take your shame to the light of the world and find love and grace and freedom from shame, not in the darkness of hiding your shame, but in the light of His face. His grace, His truth, His faithfulness. That's what we see on this table before us. God offers sinners everything they need. Just as bread and wine are emblematic of life sustained, so too these ordinary elements in, in the bread and the wine, God pledges afresh to His people the life and mercies of Christ. The recipients of the promise. Now the meaning and the content of the promise. Light and darkness, you know, feature prominently in John's Gospel. That theme reaches its zenith here, though we'll continue to see it throughout uh, his Gospel. Or we're, we're told at the opening, the, the prologue of the Gospel, that the Word was made flesh, that the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. That light and, and darkness are still in mortal combat. But that the victory of light is certain. Because light has entered the world and darkness cannot destroy the light. That's the way light is, isn't it? By its very nature, the light banishes the darkness. In Christ alone there is light and outside of Him there's only darkness. And He'll vindicate this claim as He heals the blind man in the next chapter. What Jesus offers to His people, the, the content of His promise is to banish Darkness forever for those who follow Him. They will have light.
This is a light that lasts. Unlike the ceremonies of the feast which have faded, Jesus promises to banish darkness that they may dwell in the kingdom of His beloved Son, sharing in the inheritance of the saints in light. Calvin saw this verse, this verse as a promise, as a, as a great assurance, a great comfort for the believer in Christ. In all our spiritual weakness and disappointment with ourselves, all our frustration because of our indwelling sinfulness, in the midst of affliction by the wicked, here is the Savior's promise. Follow me, and you will have life. You will have the light of life. Your sin may come upon you. The temptation, temptation may overwhelm you, and you feel you're lost. But the Savior says, follow me, and you will have the light of life. Your circumstances may forebode doom and disgrace and destruction, affliction, sickness, and betrayal at every turn. But the Savior says, follow me and you will have the light of life. Here, the light of the world offers not a glimpse, not a glimmer of His love and warmth and joy, but all of it, He says. You will have the light of life. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank You for the faithfulness of Your Son who came into our dark world that we may behold His light and beholding His light, see Your glory. So enable us to praise You now and forevermore. Amen. Well, brethren, let's stand. Taking up our Trinity hymnal, turning to number 481. Let's stand and sing together.
Amen. Please be seated. We come now to the Lord's table. This sacred supper was instituted by our King, commanding us to do this in remembrance of Him, and by so doing to proclaim His death until He comes. This meal fulfills the Passover as the covenant meal for God's people, just as the cross fulfills, supersedes the exodus as the culmination of redemption. Like all meals, all covenant meals, it is a sign. And that means it portrays Christ's benefits. And it is a seal. It confirms and ratifies the truth of those benefits and of the covenant. As we partake in the emblems of Christ's suffering, God confirms to us the promised benefits of the cross, of pardon, reconciliation, justification, adoption, sanctification, and glorification. We likewise reaffirm our covenant privileges and responsibilities as we anticipate His future return. We remember as we approach the Lord's table that Christ is spiritually present at the table as the common elements of bread and cup are set apart through prayer. And so it is required of all who participate in this meal that they be sincere, instructed, and accountable members of the church of our Lord Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul warns that we not participate in an unworthy manner, but to judge the body rightly. Hear what he says. Therefore, whoever drinks the cup of the Lord or eats the bread in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks, eats and drinks judgment to himself, if he does not judge the body rightly. And so what does he mean by unworthy? Is he saying we, have, we must have been good enough this week? Or is he saying if you were good enough this week, this is your reward? That's not what he's saying at all. But if you are an unbeliever or an unrepentant believer living in defiance of Christ's commands, if you don't understand the meaning of the bread and cup, or if you're not a member of Christ's church, then this meal is not for you today, but instead remain among us asking that God would speak to you. His word and sacrament. But to all who are believers, repentant, walking in obedience to Christ, understanding the spiritual nature of this supper, who are members in good and regular standing of a Protestant church, then come and partake in Christ's body and blood. This is His table. Come, find ease and refreshment for your weary souls. Let us hear Christ's words as Paul records them in 1 Corinthians 11 as he instituted this supper. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus Christ, in the night in which he was betrayed, after he had given thanks, he took bread and broke it, saying, This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of, of me. In the same way also, after supper, he took the cup, and he said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he come. And so let us set apart these ordinary elements with prayer. Almighty God, we thank you for your beloved Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior and our King. We pray that your Spirit, the Lord Jesus Christ, that your Spirit would raise us up, that we may feast with you, that your Holy Spirit would refresh our souls, strengthen our faith, that we might remain in faith, hope, and love. O Lord, by your command and promise and appointment, render these things for holy use. Meet with us, we pray. Strengthen us in your grace. We ask in Christ's name. Amen. Jesus said, take and eat. This is my body which is given for you.
Take and eat, remembering in your heart that Christ died for you. Again, after supper, he took the cup and said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Drink from it, all of you. Thank you. 